Hello everyone, it's Tasha D again, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist for Global Sports Channel Sports Personality Spotlight. Yes, as always, I have an amazing guest on for you today. She has 35 years of experience in athletics. Not only that, she's an event host and broadcaster, but she, most of all, is part of a very exclusive club called Olympic Medalist. <laughs> Welcome everyone, Catherine Merry. Catherine, so good, good, good to oh. see you. <laughs> oh my gosh, it, it's been it's been too long, but from, from one from, from one Olympic medalist to another, that little club that we're in is is a very special one. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> lovely to see you too. Now we were just discussing before you came on how long i mean we feel like we see each other every day on instagram and things like that but it really has been quite a while since we were face to face chit chatting <laughs> and and the difference is you look exactly the same and i don't um, Not, you look don't fab either. you look fabulous it, it was it's a lot it's a long time tasha isn't it because you moved back over to the states so uh, you know it's well over yeah. a decade ago so it's 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 a long time since our athletic days but yeah, it's it's, it's, it's lovely to see you. So good, so good. Great to catch up. And you, you're calling from where today? Um, I live in Birmingham, which is the second city of England. So slap bang in the middle, um, yeah. which uh, a place you know very well, of course. Um, so yeah, South Birmingham here with my husband and two small children who are currently at this UK time in bed. I hope. Yes, yeah, so you're like, hopefully <laughs> <laughs> we'll get through without waking them up. Yeah. That's wonderful. And speaking of children, you said that you are doing a bit of homeschooling these days with the lockdown and everything. Has that been yeah. all right? <laughs> it's, um, it's, been, it's been testing. Um, you know, there's many things that I believe I could have done in my life, but a teacher is now definitely not one of them. <laughs> I don't have the skill set, the knowledge or the patience. Um, my, my two have been brilliant, though, to be fair. They're six, they're six and nine. So they're still at quite a testing age and very different in terms of what they're learning. But no, it, it, it's the way of the world, isn't it, Tash? You know, we have to homeschool here in the in the UK and it's going to go on for another few months. Yeah. Um, but they're receptive, they're learning and we're like everybody in the world. We're just doing the best that we can. The only word I heard there, Catherine, was patience. <laughs> and I was like, yep, yeah, that's the one that wouldn't allow me to teach no. at all. And you know what? And that that's the athlete in us. I'm telling you, honestly, I've got I've got so little patience with, and I have to remember. I like, no, but look, Kath, your daughter is six. She she is six, <laughs> yes. and and I'm talking to her like, I don't, what's wrong? Why do you, I don't get? How can you not understand that? And I'm like, no, she's six, and my right. son is nine. So I'm, my patience is. It's getting better though. I have progressed and developed myself. <laughs> right. It's a long journey for us athletes with patience. We want everything right, 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 right there now. You go. Are they there you are go. they sporty too, your children? Um my my son very much so. He's he's 10 shortly and isn't it funny though? I don't know whether they they do this with with Jaden for you Tasha, but everybody that looks at my son because he's tall, he's slim, he is fast. But is he fast because he's just a child? and he's my son or is he f actually fast so it's always right. oh, he's bound, he's bound to be <laughs> yes. supported because you did so well at sport and i'm like mm, okay right but he has he loves soccer he loves football he he's mad into football um and my daughter's not quite there yet but she loves playing football with her brother as well so she's she's not as sporty as him but yeah right right well yeah i have the same thing with Jaden, but he's avoiding the hurdles like the plague right now so we'll see we'll see what happens with that but it's interesting because you were you were pretty fast i mean it was pretty obvious that you were a fast little lady from a quite a young age right yeah i was yeah that's it's very fair to, to say actually tash yes um i was one of those as you know one of those youngsters that everything i did I just happen to be good at and I'm not quite sure why because <laughs> right. I I wasn't training like a mad youngster in a sport, you know, five, six times a week, pulling tires down the road or running up hills. You know, I, I, I trained two, three times a week, which is, you know, is standard in UK club yeah. athletics. But I was just fast and I hurdled and I long jumped and I high jumped. Um, but at the age of 13, I, I took the decision just to concentrate on sprinting. Um, yeah which is a regret actually, if I'm being honest, Tash. I wish I'd have just taken one more of the events that I was good at and progressed it a little bit longer because I became a, a pretty good sprinter, 
But who's to say I could have been good at better at high jump or better at long jump, right. which is why I, I encourage my children to try everything. Right. If you don't like it, you don't have to pursue it, but at least give it a try. And right. I'm very much into it. I think that's great advice. That's something I also agree with because my coach, when I was 15, I was doing a pentathlon and he's like, no, you have to specialize in the hurdles. So I specialize and I don't, maybe I could have been a great heptathlete, <laughs> you know, who knows? You, you so I totally, that is, that is good advice for a youngster to really just yeah. be broad. You actually were number one in seven events when you were a, 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 a youngster. <laughs> Did you know how special that was at the time? Like, what were your feelings? Were you like, <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm number one. How was that being that good at so many things that young? It was it was fabulous. It, it really was. <laughs> it was it was great um, value at school. You know, I, I started running internationally at 13, so I had a little bit of time off around the weekends. So that was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought I was great at school, but for me, you know what, Tash, it was. Looking back, which is obviously wonderful with hindsight, at the time it was great, but I think look back and think that was actually a lot of pressure. I mm. had a, a lot of a lot of pressure um, and a lot of expectations on me because we know what it's like in any sport. They're always looking for the next best thing, yes. um, and, we, and we had a fabulous um, uh, sprinter called Kathy Cook, who was a wonderful 400 meter runner, our former British record holder, and everybody was looking for the next Kathy Cook, and was it going to be me? And the pressure that came with that. Was, was quite hard to handle. And, and, and you'll know that. You, fo you followed Sally Gunnell in, in Great yes. Britain, who was an Olympic champion, a world record holder. So yes. that, expectation's, <laughs> that expectation's tough, right? And, and, right? and I had it from about 12, 13 years old. So at how the time... Yeah, how did you um, handle I, that as a teenager? I, I had a very good set of people around me. I think, yeah. you know, we always hear people say, don't we, in any walk of life, whatever role they do, that if you surround yourself with good people who keep you level headed, who keep everything realistic. Um, and I was I was wonderful and, and very lucky to have my mum and dad at the time who right. who kept my feet on the ground. Not that I was flying off thinking, you know, I was the best thing since sliced bread, as we say here in England. Right. But they, 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 they kept me grounded that I knew, but I knew myself, Tash, that I still worked hard at school. I still got my qualifications because I was very aware that it could end at any time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I dealt with it. Okay. I think my parents felt it quite hard. They, right. they really did find it quite hard in terms of the attention and all the different stuff that came with it. And I have an older brother who, who just didn't care. And that was fabulous. <laughs> well, they had no idea what they were in for because it only it only got better from there. I know at 14, you broke the record in the 60 meter indoors, which to put in perspective for our audience, you held for at least 29 years. Do you still have that record? No, no. And you know what? I don't I don't care what people say about when they have a record that's of good stature and, and you know, it's, it's, it's there to be broken. You know, I'm pleased it's, it's been broken. I, yeah. I was I, I, I was disappointed, man. I'm not I'm not going to lie to you. I, <laughs> I, 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 I'd had that. Well, it was you're right. It was a world age record for a 14 year old girl running over the 60 meters. And yeah, 7.35 seconds at 14. And I'm proud it took 29 years before it got to, broken yeah, by an yeah. American. You, I just knew it was going to be an American American girl that came along, right? right. But yeah, I, I held that a long time. I still got hurdles, I think, and high jump records from times gone by as well. But yeah, right. that, that was special. It meant, it meant it was good, right? When it lasts it's a little definitely bit. Definitely good. Lasts, right? yeah, when you get a little wear out of it, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you break the world record and a week later someone else breaks it. It's like, hmm. <laughs> 29 yeah. years is a solid run you know thank one you, thing you. i distinctively remember is that any time you ran if someone was talking about you they would say you know that fast white girl <laughs> you know that fast white girl like it was a thing that there was a white girl that was fast were you aware of of that and 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 if so how did that make you feel going into your competitions yeah a hundred percent aware um because it was brought to my attention from a, a very early age, not not even by the press, not even by the articles that were written or the press attention that I got. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they obviously 
never alluded to the fact of, oh my God, there's this white girl running really, really fast. But just from other people on the team that didn't take it very well and weren't as nice about it. Um, so I was fully aware that I was slightly different um, being in a sprint event and, and running so well. Um, did it change my output of, of the way I trained and performed? No, it just put a little bit of fuel on the fire, if anything, Tash, do you know what I mean? Right. I, I was just doing what I was doing and I was beating people because I was faster than them and better than them and getting the attention for that. Whereas some felt I was getting that attention because I was white with blonde hair. Right. No, it's because I'm running faster than you and I'm beating you. And that'll be probably the main reason. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> when you say that they weren't nice about it, what were some of the things that you had to go through? Because as a youngster, you a lot of times you're not even aware this is a thing until it becomes a thing. So you don't necessarily have the tools to handle it. What what were some of the things that you had to go through in terms of, of how people treated you? Were they just, was it verbal or? Yeah, well, you, you know the score. Do you know what I mean, Tash? Athletics is, is, is an individual sport, but therefore means it's always collectively a lot of people with different personalities, different viewpoints, different backgrounds that are thrown together because of the dynamic of track and field with all the different events that we have. Exactly. And we know it breeds completely different personalities. You know, we think, and I say me and you, us sprinters, we think middle distance and long distance runners are mad because they're <laughs> just like... Yes. Oh, you know, we, uh, I'm just going out at five o'clock in the morning for another 10 miler. Well, good luck. And, you know, we train at 10 o'clock because sprinters, we just like things short and sweet and, yeah. and throw at the different personalities. So when you put all that eclectic uh, mix of, of personalities into it and then with somebody like me who was doing well in an event that really I probably wasn't supposed to be in terms of being a little young white girl, um, the, the, the abuse um verbally that came along with that the snide remarks that came along with that the the the, the, the mild form of, of of bullying that came along with that mm. uh, for someone that's 14 15 16 and into the senior team at 17 18 it it was it it was pretty tough and it took a couple of 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 nice people on on the team to to help me and guide me and protect me from that right. because a, a a click of 5 6 7 8 10 people who aren't really in your corner um, because they're fundamentally jealous, which the bottom line it was, is, is it's not easy, but you just develop, right? You develop as a person and you overcome it because you believe that you're capable of. And I knew that I was. Right. You know, I'm glad that you, you really talk about what that was and what that was like, because I think that people don't think that it happens in reverse. It's always like it must be to someone who's black or, it must, you know, any kind of racial abuse comes in that direction. But I don't think people really recognize how that can happen in reverse as well sometimes, especially in something like sport, doing well in an event that you're not supposed to be doing yeah. well in. Now, for you, yeah. when did it go from something fun and exciting to do to this is my career. How did you, did you make that decision or is it just something that evolved? Uh, good question. It was, it was something that evolved, but I never really had designs on doing anything else. Um, mm. I just, I distinctly remember at a, talking to a teacher at, at school in a careers meeting of, you know, I was about eight or nine and, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I love this lady called Kathy Cook. And she runs really fast and she just won a medal in 1984 at the Olympics. So I'd like to do that. And you get laughed at and you get told that, well, that's not a real job. What do you actually really want to do? So I never really, I said, no, that is what I want to do. And I'm like, why are you laughing? That's, that, that's, that seems a good goal to me. I, I, I think I could have a pop at that, even at such a young age. And, and then therefore the kind of, and, and as you've alluded to, and, and we spoke about Tash, I, I ran very quickly when I was very young. Yeah. And I started being sponsored as an athlete where, you know, people give you the kit and they pay you money to actually wear their stuff. And I had my first sponsorship deal at 13. Wow. Um, so the contracts were from 13 and I was earning little bits of money and, and I was doing really, really well. And that progression that you've mentioned from running fast at 13 to 14 to 15, they're informative years in terms of what you want to do with your life with exams that every every school person has. And I worked hard at my exams, but I never had any other drive, desire or want to do a proper job. I've always just wanted to be an athlete. So when the decision came of continuing the studies, going on to university or running, you know, which 17, 18 year old Tash is going to say, you know what? 
I'll go and work nine to five. I'll, I'll go and I'll go and work nine to five. I did a course. I did a, I did a I did like a, um, a a study course on business administration that was supposed to take two years. I think I got through it in yes less than a year because it was just so dry right. and it was it just wasn't me. And I thought right full time full time full time or, or education full time athlete. And I thought I did the what's the worst that can happen? And I went full in and, and I went full in full time at eighteen. Wow. Because. I was living at home, so I could afford to. Yeah. And I thought the worst that can happen is I'll I will have to get that proper job. But you know what? I'm gonna put it off as long as I can. And 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 I'm flying towards fifty and I haven't had a proper job since. <laughs> I love it. You know, that that's I think that's what we all strive for, just to be able to do something that doesn't feel like work and that we just love. Now you mentioned that relationship or, or or speaking to your teacher and her laughing or him laughing at your decision to do track as a career. Now, those relationships can be key because there have been people who have been told, oh, don't be ridiculous, think of something real. And they actually believe that and decide yeah. against what's truly right for them. Now, those are pivotal relationships, but another pivotal relationship for an athlete is of course the coach. How do you how did you find the right coach and what was that relationship like? Because clearly it worked. You had amazing success. <laughs> you know, you know what it is. It's a case of every every person has potentially when they show talent the ability to do something. And I still believe now that it is such a massive amount of luck that is potentially involved in those sliding doors of being in the right place at the right time. You know, how many athletes do we know at a young age who refer back to their PE teacher being the one that showed a little faith in them? Yeah. And if I had, and I had that, and I, and I had parents that would support me as well. So when a coach comes along at such, again, an informative age, when you start a sport and says, you know what, you can be quite good you kind of listen because your mum and dad are 99% of the time going to tell you that even if it's not true. <laughs> yeah. so when somebody outside of that circle of trust of your family say, you've got something special, you could be quite good, you then tend to believe it more. And my very first coach at, at Rugby Athletics Club, which is a small town in Warwickshire, again in the centre of England, said to me at 10 years old, I think you can be really good. And, and Grant Taylor is his name. And you never forget that, do you? And then that yeah. sets you a pathway of, of good relationships. And I was really, really lucky to go from one coach to another, to another who put in superb building blocks along the way of my journey. So when I came to my mid twenties and I came across and had the opportunity to be coached by Linford Christie, who was the Olympic champion in Barcelona in 1992 over the 100 meters, He'd got a wonderful foundation in place. And then basically himself and Ron Rodden, my two coaches, tweaked it and played with it and worked with strength. The previous coaches are important as the ones that actually give you the success at the time. Um, and I know you can appreciate that, right? Because it's, it's, not, it's not that one coach when they, it's the people before them that have done a good job and you have to be very lucky to have those in place. Absolutely. Now you talked about moving from one coach to another as you progressed, as you needed to build from that foundation to the next, to the next. How do you make that decision of when it's time to move yeah. on? Yeah. One of, the, one of the hardest decisions that I think any athlete has to make is one, whether they commit their time and their life to a sport and let's be honest, track and field, you know, even less so in America, as you know, Tash, is, is the profile of it. You don't go into athletics to earn loads of money. Right. You go into it because you love it. So you have to make a decision of whether you're going to commit your life to it and, and put always things on hold like education and, and family and children and jobs potentially. But then you also have to kind of you just got to believe in everything that you everything that you do right you, you've you've got to invest in people that will then invest in you right. um i've forgotten what you asked me tash because i went off on a tangent <laughs> no it's, it was a good tangent no just went off on a tangent like you said because i've seen many athletes who you can from the outside oh, it's time to yeah. go it's time to go it's yeah. time but loyalty or whatever it is will just they just won't part how do you make that decision yeah. how do you know like this is it i i, ha I must move on Right, I'll, I'll answer it now. Now I've actually remembered what you asked. 
you, you know what? I think if, I struggled a couple of times when I had to move on from my coaches. And, and, and I was saying that's what that was. That was the second hardest thing that I had to do in first. Yeah. I've told you about the first one um, because you you know, people in, in athletics or in sport invest their time and their money into you. And you normally, let's be honest, you normally like them as well. Right. So having to make the decision was really, really tough. And I think I bottled it on a couple of occasions from moving from one coach to another, just because I didn't know how to say, thank you ever so much for what you've done, but you've kind of done, I think, enough for me now. And I don't think you can do any more, so I'm moving on. Because that's basically right. what you're telling a coach, right? Yeah. Um, that's basically what you're telling them. And it is heartbreaking, genuinely, if you have a good relationship with that person. But, mm -hmm. and the but has to be big enough that you go, shall I stay with this person and look back in 10 or 15 years and say, I wish I'd have done something? Or do I just say, listen, it's not you personally. You've done the best you can. And I'm not saying you're a bad coach, but for me, I need to move on. And you have mm -hmm. to grab it by the horns, don't you? Because yeah. you only get one chance. You only you only get one chance. And, and you have to be brave enough to take it. You have to yeah. be brave enough to take it. That's that's absolutely good advice because I think yeah. a lot of athletes struggle with that, but life is happening in real time. Like you said, you yeah. won't get a chance to go back and say, Oh, I should have moved on sooner. Like so giving that advice that listen, you just you just gotta put your big girl panties or your big boy pants on yeah. and, and and do what needs to be done. But like you said, you do it in a, a polite, respectful way and a, 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 in terms of gratitude yeah. and everything. And then you're you're able to move on. Now, eventually, you didn't do all the events you were doing as a youngster. You decided to yeah. specialize in the 400. How did you just, you know, how did that decision come about? Was that coach advice or did you just start to see, OK, I can really be strong here? You know what? That That's actually a, a really funny question you've asked because it wasn't coach's advice. It was I fought tooth and nail to get my coach to let me move to 400 meters wow. because I believed it was the best event for me um, because we, we spend our lives as, as athletes or as people actually in any role. You know, my husband does it in his job, my friends and family do it. You always evaluate what you're doing. You always have to look at what you're doing. You know, I'm doing things good. But I'd like to take good to great. So you know what? I need to change events because I was running fast at 100 and 200, but I thought with the Sydney Olympics coming up a couple of years before, I'm not, I'm not going to stand on a podium, Tash. I wasn't quick enough. Right. You know, I, I was running 10, 8, 10, 9 and running 22 flat or 21, 9, but I had really good speed endurance. So I actually knew in myself taking ownership of what I know I could do and the session showed it that I wanted to move to 400. But my coach at the time, the aforementioned, Linford Christie, who was a hundred meter specialist and very rarely dabbled at two hundred because he hated it, was didn't wasn't in agree in, in agreement with me. He thought mm. I needed to run faster over hundred and two hundred before I moved to four hundred. So condense that debate down to about a year. <laughs> That's how long we wow. said I want to move. No, you're not. I want to move. No, you're not. And then he gave me the chance to run at our national trials, our British championships, to run a 400. And it was a case of, right, I've been banging on about this for quite a long time. I need to now deliver a performance. And I did. I ran a fourth or fast, fastest time in the world wow. at that time. Then I could go up to him, Tash, and say, you see, I told you I should move to 400. And then you know what he said? To, I swear, you know what he said? Because you, know you know my old coach. He yeah. turned to me and said, Kath, I don't know why you didn't do it sooner. <laughs> that is a typical response. That is a typical exactly. response. Oh my it's gosh. Yeah, not, many not many people get to tell Linford Christie, told you so. <laughs> exactly. And then <laughs> it was that a, is a response he would give. It, it, it was, oh, you know, what, what do you do when your coach says that? You got, you got the one voice saying, kick him in the shins. And then you've got the other <laughs> voice saying, just walk away because you've got a session tomorrow. I decided to walk away. But you know what was, what was so good about that, though, Tash, was a case of he didn't just give in to me and say, OK, do whatever you like. He had a reason for not letting me do something. Right. And I had to prove with my own ability 
and get past his stubbornness and prove to myself and to him that I was capable. And then as soon as I moved events, as you mentioned, um, in the middle of a 1999 season prior to, prior to the Olympics in Sydney, I moved mid-season, which is unheard of, to change events in the middle of the year. But it went really well. It went well in that World Championship final, which I got to, and then the Sydney Olympics were the next year. But it goes opportunity, Tash. It's opportunity again. You see something, you believe in yourself, you have to back yourself, and therefore then you have to do what's needed to to hopefully get that to come to fruition. Absolutely. I'm I, I'm glad you didn't choose the option to kick him in the shins. That would have been all over the newspapers, all over the sun. <laughs> Catherine Mary kicks <laughs> Lymph and Christie in the shins. But I am really glad that you knew and believed in yourself so much so that you really put your foot down and you really pursued it. You didn't, didn't take, oh, well, no, he said no, and then just keep going. You you kept pursuing that because what that led to was you, like you said, being in Sydney, being in, in what many people have called the most iconic Olympic race in history against Kathy, Kathy Freeman at yeah, the time yeah. in the stadium 110 plus thousand people talk yeah. about the lead up to those games you've you've only been specializing in the 400 for a short period at this time you're up against one of the most you know notorious people in the event she's she's so well known the event is huge at the time my gosh what was the pressure like leading up to that how did you get ready for that yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's an interesting one that uh, surprisingly, Tash, I never tire of talking about. Um, it was, it was <laughs> and you can see actually in my study. Hang on, let me get this right. So this is the picture. There's yeah. the finish line. So there's my finish line picture. Wow. Um, I'm there somewhere, full of lactic. That was the picture I, I took after on by Sydney Harbour Bridge that I got paid by a paper, lots of money to go and do with my medal. Right. And then there's my number. I don't know whether you've still got your number from, from Beijing or when you Somewhere. made the final. But yeah, so there's my little homage in my study. That's all. But it, it was it was fantastic. To, you know, just for you saying then, which is so nice, to be involved in one of the most iconic races in Olympic history. It just kind of sums it up because it was a pleasure and I was absolutely blessed to take part and have one of those eight lanes because... As you mentioned, Cathy Freeman was the only Australian in track and field that that Olympics to have a genuine chance of a Olympic medal, Olympic gold medal. Mm -hmm. um, so the pressure was huge. Um, reigning world champion, she got silver four years previously in Atlanta. The whole nation expected, and the build-up was massive. Mm -hmm. But I was cool because, as you say, 2000 was my first full year of 400 meter running. Um, and sadly ended up being my only full year of 400 meter running. So it went quite well, but I didn't have any, any real major pressure on me because it was all on Cathy. So mm -hmm. it was a case, it was Cathy's to lose. And if anybody could spoil the party, which I tried very hard to do, it would be fabulous. It'd be great, but I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it because I wasn't expected to win. I was touted to kind of potentially get a medal, which does bring its own pressure and expectation. But I could always fall back on the fact of, well, I've, I've just changed events. This is my my first year in this event, just to remind everybody. So I had that to fall back on. Yeah. So I I, I loved it. I, yeah. I, I loved it. It was... Nothing to lose and everything to gain. Oh, 100%. 100% it was. It was nothing to lose is exactly the right expression, yeah. Right. After you said... That, that was your only really full year at the 400. So what was going on after the Games? How were things panning out? Oh, they, well, they started to go downhill um, in terms of injuries and illness from the middle of the next season in 2001. Um, obviously, the Games were fantastic, you know, you know, they, they went so well. You know, I, I bought my first house after Sydney in November 2000. And, yeah. and you know what it's like. You win an Olympic medal it, it, in, in the right event. It can be life changing. And I'm, I'm fully aware over 20 years later that running 49.72 seconds back on the 25th of September in 2000, it changed my life forever, 100% yeah. Yeah. because of the opportunities and what I've gone on to do. But everything was going fantastic until the middle of the next season when I ended up running the fastest time in the world over 400 meters and running a personal best. And then I started to get injured. 
um, everything started to, to fall apart and I had to sack off the 2001 season and miss the world championships, watch people running slower than I'd run in my second race. Um, but that's the way life goes, right? You know, I yeah. ended the year as the fastest woman in the world, but it didn't mean anything because I didn't deliver at the world championships when I believe I could have won it, but I didn't. So quite rightly, no one really cares. And that's fair enough because I then got into broadcasting in terms of talking about athletics because I was an Olympic medalist. Let's talk about the 400 metres with the British Broadcasting Corporation or the BBC would ask me to do stuff. So you kind of, it's those sliding doors again, isn't it, Tash? Right. And one thing starting to go wrong, but I wasn't ready to retire then. So I said, I'll do bits and pieces, but I've still got a lot to give because I'd only really kind of just started my second life with a new event. So right. I right. tried, I tried, I tried. And then I moved to America. I lived there for a while. Um, but then finally, obviously retired. But yeah, the next year, that was tough. I'm not going to lie to you. If I sat here now and I thought about 2001 and what it meant to me, and I'm going to try not to, I, I will get upset. I genuinely can still very instantaneously get upset about the, with the frustration and disappointment of not being given the opportunity because my body didn't allow it. And that's how much it means right. to us, though, doesn't it? That's how much it means. Yeah, and I, I, I love that you bring that up, though, because I think this is something that a lot of athletes experience, but shut down inside. And then we see a lot of depression. We see a lot of suicide. We see a lot of attempted suicide. I mean, I was looking online today and I, I put in Olympi Olympians who commit suicide, athletes, who, and it just is one after another after another. So I think it is important to, to talk about some of those emotions and how you were able to to keep yourself still in a position where you are able to talk about it, be here to talk about it today, or was it something that you just stuffed away at the time? Yeah, you kind of, you kind of stuff it away, don't you really? Um, unless somebody kind of asks you about it. So, you know, right. you bounce around. Um, you know, I'd, I'd fallen apart with my Achilles in particular, um, but I was determined to continue and therefore, you know, what we like, we, we do the research. He goes, what, you know, what treatment can I get? Where can I get this treatment yeah. from? Um, and someone said, oh, you can go to the, um, you can go to the West Coast of America and get some prolotherapy. And they, they don't do it in the UK, but you can go. I flew over. I saw a doctor in, in Orange County. Um, he helped me. I moved my life. I shut my house down and I moved and lived in Scottsdale for nearly a year in Arizona. Wow. And even though I still kept falling apart and needed another knee operation, I retired really really happy with my decision because i'd left no stone unturned mm -hmm. and i think that's really important with any goal or, or drive that people have is to to leave no stone unturned but be flexible and adaptable along that journey because then you have to accept some things are going to go wrong right and that's why mm -hmm. i think it's so important sports people have to accept their journey from from a to b isn't potentially always going to be a smooth one and how am i going to deal with that how am i going to handle that and I didn't talk to many people about it because I was still on my, I can do this. I can get back. Look, I, I, I ran really fast. I can get back when I'm fit. And I never got back and I never got fit. But it's very important. And but I, I, when I retired, that's the toughest thing, Tash. When I actually decided to retire, which I didn't plan to do, I went to the track one day and then put my bag down because I was rehabbing. And then I went, I'm done. I said to my coach at the time when I was living in the US, I'm done. He goes, what, today or forever? I said, I'm done. And I, I'm going to get upset again, you see. And I picked up my bag and I never went back. And I didn't, and I just retired on the spot without even planning to. But it was the right time. What but then it got to that stopped. moment that you just, that, that, that you just realized it, it was it. Was there something that happened or you just felt something inside? No, it, you... it was literally, Tash, it was a kind of, Gosh, you know what it's like when you're rehabbing or you've been you've been taken off a pathway. Anybody that has a plan and they get knocked off their pathway, you have to try very hard, obviously, to get back on it. And you can only really do that so many times without with the amount of setbacks that you can have that until one day, you know, they say the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, I was rehabbing from another knee operation then something else went wrong. And they, that was it. It was like, oh, man, instantaneous. I've had enough. You know, I'm, 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 I'm poncing around on the side of a track doing rehabilitation drills. And you're seeing everybody else flying through on the track, through three and 400 meter reps and they're flowing. And you're there doing your tippy tappy rehab to make yourself get back. I'm like, I'm done. I've had, I've had enough. Um, but then I, I moved back to the UK and then that was tough. That was a tough time. 
that I've never really spoke about that, but that was a tough time when I moved back because I was like a lot of other athletes. What the hell am I going to do now? Mm. I've dedicated my life since I was 10 years old to track and field. What am I going to do? And and that was that was that wasn't a good time. That what that wasn't a good time. And doctors put me on antidepressants that made me feel worse. And within about five days of taking them, I went, hell no, 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 no. I'm, I'm off, I'm off, I'm, I, can, I can do this myself, I can do this myself, which I understand isn't easy for some people to do. But I was just like, no, God almighty, sort yourself out. And you, yeah. you do that with good people, good people, good people around you. As you know, I can totally relate to that because I went yeah. through that depression stage as well, ended up on the antidepressants. I was like, whose body is this? Like, I couldn't figure out yeah. if how I was feeling was just old age or or these yeah. or this medication. And like when I ended up in the hospital, I had that same thought that you had. I said, no, I can't. I've got to figure out how to sort myself yeah. out. So what what gave you the courage? Because I know from my own experience, having the courage to speak up and tell someone that you are struggling, that you are low and personalities like ours, you probably got some of the same responses I got was, oh, you're Tasha Danvers, you'll be all right. You know, you speak, you do speak and you're on TV. You, you, They just pat you on the back and they don't take it seriously. What gave you that courage? How were you able to, to reach out and make sure that you got the help? that you needed, even though it wasn't something that you continued, it actually made you realize what you needed to do for yourself. But what gave you the courage to speak up? I think I think I'm like many people where you just kind of hit a brick wall with it because you you left yourself no other option. You've kind of kept it to yourself. You've kind of carried on smiling. You've you know, everybody thinks that your life's great. And why wouldn't it be? You know, gosh, I, you know, I and in this great race and I had this medal and I was popping up in, started to pop up in media and broadcasting. But my whole identity had gone. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I actually spent a lot of time not really knowing who I was, but I kept it all to myself because I thought, and you get the feeling, don't you think, well, I've got no reason to complain because if I do say that I'm struggling, people like you say, Tash, people will go, no, you're not. Don't be, mm. don't be so stupid. And you keep that in and you keep that in until you literally self-combust and you explode and something happens, doesn't it, that makes you go, you know what, I now need to confide in somebody or something. And again, it was trusting people for me. You know, I, I, I managed to speak to somebody who I trusted, who happened to be in a position to be able to help me. And I know that's probably why I spoke to them, because I knew that person was the one that could give me a lifeline that could say to me, Kath, this is how I can potentially help you out. Leave it with me. We'll work on this together. But right. it did have to take the point of I'm going to I just can't do it anymore. I was pushed push to the limit of trying to not pretend I was not OK until something then happens and it's very rare isn't it Tash for somebody to get to that point and it's very sad when people get to that point yeah. that they feel they haven't got anybody and I hate seeing that and I hate seeing it with athletes I see now because we I can see it happening or I hate it with people I know because you just want to say to them please just talk to somebody just pick one person you trust what's yeah. the worst that could happen if you've talked to that person I guarantee you you'll feel better yeah. And, and yeah. a lot of people sadly don't feel they can they can do that. And it doesn't end in it ends in a very, very sad way. But talking is is easy to be said to do. But sometimes it's not very easy, is it? But just pick one person. That's what I did. I picked the one person who I trusted. Right. I think that's great advice. And, and I'll even say on top of that. And if that person doesn't respond the way you think, try and think of one more person to reach out yeah. to. Because you know I, mean? I did that and I'm like, OK, not you. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, because they gave me a pat on the back. They said you'll be all right. And it took so much courage to even bring it up. So, but, but yeah, it's true. If you just can think of at least one person, I think it makes all the difference. Yeah. Now you said after you came back home, it's almost like you, you may have felt like you were back at square one. Um, you, you'd sold your house, you'd given up everything to go to America. Now you're back at home. The plan hasn't worked out. You're like, what am I going to do? What was the situation for you like at that time? And how did you get to the point where, okay, I, I've got a new focus now. Did Was that journey long? And just how did you cope? How did you cope with that transition? Retirement for an athlete is, is a huge deal. So what was it like? It is. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I think there's very few athletes that get to retire 
from essentially their their dream job um, on their on their on their own terms. There's very few of us. I, I can't think of any of our teammates really that have retired. I, I struggle to think of people that have retired because they want to, rather mm -hmm. than the fact that they were battling injuries and they fell apart. Um, so no, it was it, it was. It was tough. It, it was it was really, really, really tough when when I came back. But the the gradual integration into doing something else just kind of started to pick up and started right. to get more busy. So while I was sitting there thinking, oh, my God, what the heck am I going to do? It's like, Kath, will you come and contribute on this or will you talk to us about this? Again, just because of that Olympic final, Tash, because to win that individual Olympic sprint medal means that people kind of want to hear what you've got to say, which is nice. Right. And I like to think that I can articulate that in a way that is understandable and, and if need be reasonably insightful. So right. all of a sudden that start, that work started picking up and I started to do more and more and I'm like, Oh, hang on. Okay. There, this is, this is, this is the road. I didn't, I didn't choose it. I didn't plan it. But that's kind of just what happened, and and I, I went with it, right, and right. obviously, and then one thing led to another, and I just kept asked, get asked to do more stuff, and then I started to digress into different areas of of speaking, basically. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you even did a column with the Telegraph at one time, didn't you? Oh, I love that. Yeah, the the Daily Telegraph is is. They asked me to do a column because um, of all my qualifications that I worked hard to get at school, my two A. <laughs> My two A GCSE grade levels were in English, so I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm quite good with words in terms of hopefully speaking or writing. And the Telegraph asked me to do this column, and they said, "Yeah, you could just speak to somebody, you know, once every couple of weeks, Kath, and we'll write it up." I said, "No, no, 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 no. If I'm putting my name to a column, I think you'll find that I'm actually going to write it, right? Because that's my column." <laughs> Just no, no, little... no, 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 that doesn't normally work like that, Kath. You just speak to someone, they write it on your behalf. Right. No, <laughs> but I wrote it myself and I, oh, I loved it. I really loved it. And that, that was a, that was great to do. Um, and again, it's another little thing that I got into that I, at the time I, at the time I enjoy, but with most things and a lot of things in media, you are, you do them for a little bit of time, then something else, somebody else comes along. Um, there's no longevity in it. And, you know, that's actually a lot of the things that I do. That is the case. So you have to make sure you do a good job yeah. and you can outlive those that could potentially replace you going forward. Right. Um, but that's why we work hard at what we do. Right. To try and get yeah. that longevity in it. But, yeah, I did. I did loads of things. It was it was good fun. It really speaks, though, to the to the power of saying yes, you know, when an opportunity comes your way. Even I'm sure when when you were first asked, you're like, oh, God, I've, I've never been on TV. I don't know how to do all this stuff. But you said yes to it. And now this is literally what you do. Because of that, you've also been on the front line, basically, of so many things that have happened in sport, a lot of controversial things. You actually got the chance to interview Casta Semenya, who literally is the poster child for gender issues in yeah. sports today. What was that conversation like? And what are your thoughts on that whole topic now? Yeah, that's a, that was an interesting one, actually, in terms of when I spoke to her, because I, I think it's for the last bar COVID last year when I couldn't travel. I kind of infield hosted um, the Diamond League in Eugene in Oregon for the last 10 years. So I get to kind of set up the event, chat, 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 and then talk to all the athletes after they've run. Um, and this one was in a different venue because, of, of course, Hayward Fields hosting the World Athletic Championships. And so they were redoing the stadium there in Eugene. So we did it somewhere else. And Casta was always going to win the 800. So Casta Semeni was always going to win this race. Right. And so obviously I was fully aware that I would interview her because she'd won the women's 800. And it is one of the most, Tash, and I've interviewed a lot of people in various environments for various things. And this is probably one of the most striking, profound interviews that I've ever done with anybody. Not because there was any controversy in it, because that wasn't the time, that wasn't the place. I was directed 
to make sure there was no controversy in the interview with the crowd, right? Because she's a Nike athlete at a Nike meeting. Let's just talk about the race that you've just dominated and, and, and how you ran that. So I wasn't allowed to, right. but I didn't need to because she came over, Tash, and literally the crowd went silent because they were going to hear from Caster because obviously things were still kicking off with the, with the issues that she has and with the sport. And just as I asked my first question to her about you winning at this Diamond League again, fantastic, you know, um, took it out from wherever you took it out and technical talk. One person, there was science, there was one person, Tash, in the whole of the stadium that just stood up and started to boo as loudly as they possibly could over the end of my question before she'd even started talking. So I'm there with the microphone. Yes, it would rather. And I go over to her like that. Just as she was about to answer, some guy, boo, in the loudest possible, it rang oh around the stage. I looked in her eyes, literally, and I swear to God, I just saw part of her just absolutely crumble and just collapse inside. And I've never felt so sorry for somebody at that moment in time. And she answered it with class. She answered it with complete word precision and continued on and the guy kept going the guy kept booing but she kept going on and she kept going on and that I, it was I, I think i wrote an article about it afterwards because it, i didn't see that coming right and it was and it was it was horrible and and it just gave me a little bit of a glimpse into Casta semenya's life and how she has to deal with things on a daily basis with the battle that she's going through to try and compete in in track and field right right do you have any thoughts at, at this time? Because this is such a tricky issue. I don't even know how they're going to figure it all out. Do you have any thoughts? Because I know as you competed there, you probably there was probably a few ladies who you had question marks about that you have to go up against. And if it's a difference between you getting gold or you getting silver, how important do you think it is for this issue to be figured out and resolved? The, the importance of, of the issue is it's massive you know that we anybody can actually acknowledge and say this is a massive massive issue how you deal with it is the is the next thing and you know what and i don't know i don't know and i battled with this because if i was competing against somebody that potentially had some form of difference to me and as you say um lost me money through major championship medals i wouldn't be very happy about it right but does that mean that it's caster's fault not in any shape or form do i understand why she's battling to be involved in the sport of course i do and i understand that totally yeah but and it does come with a but it's an issue that is going to have to be sorted but you know what i don't know how the heck they're going to do that rather than just literally say if this is your chromosome makeup and it is not this but it is this you can't compete right, because right. the, the IWF or world athletics as they are now have tried extremely hard with various measures of changing hormone medicine and testosterone in particular but this is a kind of relatively new thing although it isn't if you look back in time because there are various athletes who you can read about that have potentially had the same um the same condition, shall we say, as Castor, but it's now been really talked about since 2009. I, it's not as straightforward and it's not simple. And I feel sorry for Castor massively, but do I think she should compete in the track and field events that she's competing in? No, I don't. And I've written that um, and, and said that. And again, that's, that's, that's said with a heavy heart, Tash, because yeah. it's not, it's not Castor's fault. It's not, but, I, there has to be a there has to be a line drawn somewhere, right. but unfortunately, no one knows where that line is at this moment in time. Right, absolutely. Now you've been on both sides of of issues like that. You've also been on both sides of issues like performance enhancing drugs. You were competing in Sydney. Marion Jones was there. She's like almost like we with Caster. She's the poster child for the whole Balco scandal. Do you think? The whole issue of performance enhancing drugs and what can be done to 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 really stamp it out. It, I mean, we'll never completely get rid of it. But do you think there's been improvements in that respect when it comes to performance enhancing drugs? Or are we still kind of always behind the eight ball? 
I, th- I think we're a lot better. I, I genuinely do. Um, I read an article here in the UK, I think it was just yesterday, with the the amount of, of athletes who have been um, failed dope tests in the last four or five years. So not, not long back, you know, and there's a good 50 or 60 off the top of my head was the number that I read. And the person that wrote the article was basically saying, look, therefore, athletics are doing something and, and, and punishing people that cheat. So other sports surely have to follow, right. which is true. And, and that's what does annoy me a lot still is the rap that athletics and, and track and field gets yeah. when they actually are doing quite a lot to yeah. actually eradicate people and other sports are sitting on their hands and not doing too much. If you test more people, you're going to find more cheats. So that's why it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's as simple as that. Do I feel that more money needs to be put into the system to do that? Most definitely. I, yeah. I definitely think that there's a lot more there's a lot more money that needs to go into it to, as you say, Tash, become on a level where you're kind of level with, if not ahead of people who yeah. who have the ability, the money and the scientific people backing them to to, to make it happen. Um, but I, I, it's, there's a lot of still a lot of disjointed nature, though, isn't there? And there's been a lot recently with a lot of athletes missing um, random tests. You know, the majority of a lot of athletes recently I can think of have, have been picked up for whereabout failures and yeah. and not taking responsibility uh, for the missed tests that they're having. Uh, but different rules in different countries. I'll never forget it. I think it was around the Christian Coleman case um, when American athletes were saying, well, they have one system that happens to them. And then British athletes coming back onto them on social media saying, you're kidding me. You, yeah. you get the chance to do this, this and this before you get tested. We get a guy turning up on our doorstep when I'm cooking my dinner. We don't get, you know, so do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm yeah. not saying those two points are, are actually factually accurate, but you get my point of one rule right. here, one rule there. Somebody else pipes up in another country and says, well, we don't have that. You're like, oh, no, there's all this disjointed right. nature of trying to, to make the system better. It has to come under maybe even one bigger umbrella to make us all sing from the same hymn sheet. Absolutely. But it's damaging. It is so, so, so damaging when you're the, the leading number one sport in the Olympics, which track and field is. Um, I've, I've got mates who, who don't believe anything they see anymore. You know, I, and I've got people that won't watch track and field. And I'm like, no. And I've sat at dinners where people have talked about people that have cheated and then they look across to me. And then I will say, well, actually, well, what do you think of me then? You know, am I... Am I, am I in this category of you can't win an Olympic medal without cheating because now you're accusing me? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. No, you did, but you just forgot that I was here. Do you know what I mean? Oh, my <laughs> like... gosh. I'm so glad you brought... I just remember getting into this raging argument with a coach and at a banquet, and I, I think I felt extremely passionate because he was a coach for youth, and he said mm. exactly that. He said, you can't... You know, there's there's no Olympic medals without cheating, and I'm like, what are you on about? I mean, I was, I was so angry by that, but that is the the mentality that they actually use the people who are in the cheating game to get people to cheat because oh, oh well, everyone's oh. doing it and I'm like how do you know everyone's doing it <laughs> obviously like you like yeah. me everyone is not doing it and it's, it's no. really angering but like you said because we are stamping down on it like it and and it's always in the media it gives the impression that the whole sport is just a, it's just a matter of time before somebody who has been successful is going to get caught so with with regards to the testing and the missed tests i absolutely agree with you there needs to be more streamlined uh, uh, they usually call me i was out for shopping and they normally call yeah. me i mean in britain that's that's not the case you'll be lucky if you get a call they might call you if they see your car outside the house and they think you just haven't heard the doorbell but you know there's there's so much wiggle room it definitely needs to be some streamlining yeah. there now up and coming athletes you had a chance to compete from all the way childhood all <laughs> the way through to olympics to like we said one of the biggest most prestigious not even the most prestigious championship but the actual event that you were in was huge. If you knew that there was a young young and up-and-coming star coming through, what would be some things that you would say to them to really help them get through their career? Are there certain things that you're like, listen, you need this, you need that? What would be your toolkit for uh, an athlete on the on their way up the ranks? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question because I still feel very 
lucky to have the unique career that I had, um, which did that transition, as you say, Tash, from junior to senior. You know, I had six years on the junior team um, before I went into the senior age group um, and internationally from 13. So I feel there is the kind of that knowledge and experience there, which I have shared in the past with the British junior team a couple, for a couple of years when we had a different person in charge of the whole setup of UK athletics in particular, to share yes. that knowledge. And, and then we have athletes now. Um, I'm thinking of a, a sprinter in particular that we have here in the UK who is young and she's running fast. And she's just started, uh, I think she's at Cambridge University. Um, Amy Hunt, our name, because she's yeah. doing really, really well. And I look at her and I look at her career and I think, okay, you're doing it right. Because the one thing I'll always say is that if you're lucky enough, because not everybody is lucky enough to surround yourself with um, a happy family, a caring family, a supportive family, that's great if you've got it. But yeah. what if you haven't got that and you're battling against parents that don't want you to run or people that think athletics is, is means to nothing and you need to study and educate properly? It's a case of always fighting your corner, but always fighting it with, with positive and what's the word I'm looking for? Not realistic, but, you know, you have to prove to people that you really want to do it. So you have mm. to stand your ground and really back yourself but do it in a do it in the proper way and then you've got kind of half a chance to actually develop into something that could be half decent um and most athletes do do that but a lot of athletes don't because they think they'll be young forever or they think if they've got talent at a certain age that that's going to transpire into senior talent and with the greatest of respect no one cares what you do as a junior is yeah. whether you do that transition into seniors. So it's 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 believing in yourself, backing yourself, being persistent in what you want to do, but then also surrounding yourself with the best people that you possibly can and, and not taking it too seriously, which is really hard to say, isn't it, Tash? When you're trying yeah. to tell a, a 16 or 17-year-old, you know, this will be great if you achieve this, but just in case you don't, you know, do this and do that. And it is hard because they can't see past the end of their nose. Do you know what right. I mean? They... <laughs> They, they they think that they, they're going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And let's be honest, it, the majority of the time it doesn't happen, which yeah. is why then you have to make sure you're you're a realistic kind of person that, that then can deal with the fact that you might not make it as a senior, you might not make it to the Olympics. And how are you going to deal with that? That's That's by being true to yourself. And a lot of athletes I know nowadays aren't true to themselves. Right. Because a lot of them think they're going to make it, and we can look at them and say, "Not really quite mm. sure that's going to happen." Yeah, a little dodgy that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, like you said, I mean the pool is so massive of potential athletes out there, but you know, it's only one that is usually like the mega star or you know the superhero. So there has to be a balance, like you said. Kathy, it's been amazing yeah. getting some insight from you today and just getting your perspective on everything. I've really appreciated uh, catching up with you. But before you go, I want to have a little fun with you. I'm going to play a little game Ooh. of this or that, right? So you just pick one <laughs> or the other, all right? So live television or pre-recorded? Pre-recorded all day long. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a feeling you might say that. iPhone or Android? Oh, iPhone, iPhone. Athlete or presenter? Athlete. On the infield or in the studio? Oh, see, I knew this one. I get asked this a lot. <laughs> in the, in, I always go infield or commentary, infield or commentary. And I can't decide, infield or studio? Infield, I'm in there. I'm in the thick of it. I'm infield, infield. Yeah, that's your personality all day long. Yeah. Last question. What would you want the world to know? I'm going to Oprah Winfrey oh. on you right here. Oh, I love this. <laughs> what do I want the world to know? Um, gosh, that's a really good question. I don't know. What do I want the world to know? I want the world to know that I truly believe, and this is all going to sound a little bit mushy, isn't it? But I truly believe anybody can potentially be what they want to be. I, I genuinely do believe that's the case. Because as you've just said a few moments ago, Tasha, it's only normally some normally one person in a million that can do something spectacular. 
yeah. in terms of track and field or sport or in life. And my motto and what I say to young kids when I do speak to them is, why can't it be you? Tell me a reason why that one person can't be you because it has to be somebody and there's no reason if you make the right decisions and put yourself in a good place in a good environment give me tell me why it can't be you and they go okay yeah so that would oh, be wow. it it can always it's always got to be somebody right <laughs> i love that you know that actually gave me goosebumps when you said that why can't it be you i absolutely love that kathy yeah. if Catherine, if anyone wants to catch up with you follow you see what you're up to see what your next events are or even hire you for another for an event how can they find you <laughs> Oh, that's nice of you to say. Well, I live in Birmingham. You know the accent. So I'm only joking. <laughs> South Birmingham. You'll find me around a track. Um, but that was really bad. That's a Birmingham accent for anybody that doesn't know where that's from. And I don't speak like that. But no, I reside most of the time, I have to say, on Twitter, at Catherine Merry. And it's a K and an A, which I feel I spend a lot of my life saying to people. It's Catherine with a K with an A in the middle and Merry as in Christmas. Um, and I do do Instagram, but I'm not very good on that, Tash. I, I don't really get the, the, the quick fire turnover of Instagram, but I'm Catherine.Merry on that. Um, but yeah, I'm always on there one or the other. Awesome. Thank you so much. Like I said, it's been such a pleasure. I hope to hear from you soon. We, we, we can't leave it so long next time to, I to know, have a I bit know. of a chin wag. Exactly. <laughs> All right. no, lovely, to, lovely to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, you know what? It, I just remember being on the team. I was on the team in Sydney when, when Catherine was there and she's always been such a tough cookie, such a fighter. And it was really, really a pleasure to kind of get her insight. She's been on both sides. She's been on the broadcasting side, the interviewing side. She's been the athlete. She's been a junior athlete. She's been a senior athlete. She's had rough times. She's had the height of success. So um, an all rounder there. And I'm just really glad we had the opportunity to chat to her a little bit. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe and comment on your favorite part of that interview i guess i'll see you again next time ciao for now